Thank you for having me as part of this session. My name is Ed Mariano and I'm a professor at Stanford and I'll be talking about transitional pain services, focusing on some of the priorities and perspectives that I've learned in just a few years of having to address some of the issues related to pain management and the opioid epidemic. I have no disclosures. And I think from the perspective of the United States, uh, the opioid epidemic has gotten a lot of uh, much needed attention. And I think even before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there were um, a fairly startling statistics about the number of opioid overdose deaths um, that could be attributable um, and counted you know, for many of our uh, patients you know, who unfortunately uh, succumbed uh, to opioid overdose. Uh, when you look at statistics like 136 people a day, um, it, gets, it gets a lot of attention. And I think that we all know from recent statistics um, during the COVID-19 pandemic that opioid overdose deaths in the U.S. have actually gotten much worse. And while I think that the opioid epidemic is really not that simple, uh, those of us in medicine, specifically in anesthesia and pain management, have really tried to focus on some of the areas uh, that we have influence in. And in particular, you know, looking at opioid prescriptions, if you look at the graph on the left, these are data from Chad Brummett, who's a professor at the University of Michigan. Um, and he looked at a number of different studies, uh, study groups, including relatively minor surgeries. And he looked at the incidence of chronic opioid use in, those, in that patient population. And if you look here um, on the left, Carpal tunnel release and relatively minor surgery, as well as varicose vein removal, um, these kinds of operations that we typically see as day case surgeries, um, often performed under local anesthesia, um, were still, at least in the United States, prescribed opioids and led to chronic opioid use around 7% of the time. And I think that's really startling when you think about um, the, the issues that we tend to, to face in the perioperative realm. Um, when we think about some of the complications that we, that we really stress about, like surgical site infection or having um, deep venous thrombosis or um, sacral ulceration after surgery, um, th these types of uh, risks are actually in uh, fractions of a percent in terms of occurrence, um, while a complication like chronic opioid use, if it was actually considered a post-operative complication, would easily be the number one uh, most common complication after surgery. And I think if we're looking at opportunities for improvement, then in fact, yeah, the graph on the right is very telling. So yeah, when we looked at data um, across the United States, you see that not surprisingly, surgeons tend to prescribe most of the opioids, at least for the first three or four months after surgery for major surgery. But after that, you can see the purple line actually takes over and that's primary care. So as you can tell, you know, the purple line um, reaches a maximum that is almost the same as the peak of the red line, which is surgery, uh, which tells me that if patients are not off of their opioids after surgery within a reasonable number of weeks after the operation, then it's very likely that those uh, prescriptions for opioids will be transitioned to primary care and those patients will become chronic opioid users. So I think our opportunity is really in this window um, that's several weeks after surgery, up to three to four months after major surgery to make a big difference in terms of chronic opioid use. So some of the activities that I've been involved in um, on a national level have been, you know, one, the National Academy of Medicine's Action Collaborative that counters the US opioid epidemic. Um, I'm now in the third year representing the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Um, our ASA is about 55,000 members, um, and uh, it is only one of the participating organizations in this collaborative. Um, it's a complex problem, um, you know, the opioid epidemic, and so you know, this group really addresses it in more of a complex way. You can see that there are multiple different representatives um, besides, besides professional societies like ASA. Um, we also have representatives from government. So we have the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, in other work groups, we have you know, the Food and Drug Administration, as well as um, you know, our mental health and substance abuse uh, disorder organization through the uh, Health and Human Services uh, branch of the US government. We also have private insurers. We have uh, companies that are involved in healthcare delivery, like pharmacies. Um, we also have um, private insurance companies, um, yeah, as well as the Veterans Affairs Administration. 
In addition, I've worked with an international group, and this is a document that we um, published in Anesthesia um, about a year ago, you know, looking at um, how we could prevent opioid-related harm, because I think that the discussion about opioids oftentimes um, misses the point in the sense that um, the, the goal really isn't to be anti-opioid. It's really to minimize opioid-related harm and really focus on better pain management. Um, so this document, I think, which is available for free, um, I think does a good job just uh, providing the available evidence and then some very pragmatic recommendations on how to you know, best keep patients safe while still managing pain in the most effective way. Um, and it's broken down to the all phases of care. So from the preoperative period, you know, discussing with patients their opioid history as well as uh, their pain history and substance use disorder history, uh, looking at the potential for psychological interventions, setting expectations, and then in the, in the post-operative period or perioperative period, uh, really focusing on good assessment tools for pain management as well as um, employing multimodal analgesia. And you'll see here, you know, the bottom two recommendations have to do with how we prescribe opioids. For patients who are not on long-acting opioids, uh, we recommend not initiating long-acting opioids um, just because of surgery. You know, use short-acting alone whenever possible. In addition, try to avoid compound opioids, which means, um, say, for example, oxycodone with paracetamol. If you can avoid those, then you can maximize the individual use of non-opioid analgesics um, while also minimizing uh, the dosing of opioids. After surgery, I think this is the part that we do an uh, overall fairly poor job of, is really trying to limit the number of tablets that patients go home with and give patients advice on how to de-escalate therapy. So how to thoughtfully taper down their prescriptions or their usage of opioids and then cease to take opioids. Because I think that that's one of the key points um, that I think is often overlooked. And then for those uh, patients who have excess opioid, um, how to safely dispose of them or even return those opioids so that way they're not, um, they're not, we're not exposing unnecessarily um, the rest of our communities you know, with unused opioid tablets. I mentioned that the opioid overdose is not simple. And in truth, we've actually made um, a lot of progress in terms of overprescribing of opioids. And you can see here um, in the teal line that the opioid overdose deaths related to uh, commonly prescribed opioids um, has actually flattened out or even started to decrease, even though the, the overall opioid overdose deaths have been increasing. Um, these are mostly driven today by synthetic opioids um, like fentanyl and carfentanyl uh, that are being imported illegally from other countries to the U.S. I mentioned before that it can, our discussions with patients and even with healthcare systems can't just be about um, opioids. They really have to be about better pain management. And if we can provide better pain management, then we're more likely to not rely uh, too much on opioid prescriptions. And so this is a project that I led for the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Uh, we included 13 other medical and surgical organizations, and we established these seven principles of perioperative pain management. And if you sc scan the QR code, you can go to Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine uh, to, to download this particular article. And the concept really was to involve as many uh, important uh, stakeholders as possible. So in addition to ASA, uh, we also included the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, the American College of Surgeons, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as almost every subspecialty surgical society um, you know, that was interested in trying to come up with uh, what good pain management looks like. And you can see here that you know, the, these new principles for pain management, uh, not only they do they encompass multimodal analgesia, which we've mentioned already, uh, but also the importance of preoperative evaluation, uh, looking at pain history, uh, using validated tools, tailoring education to patients and their caregivers, um, disposal uh, of opioids um, or proper storage, as well as access to a pain specialist. And I think that these these seven principles you know, really represent um, an improvement in the foundation or the core of how we treat patients having surgery. And I think by doing that, we'll decrease the over-reliance on opioids. And I think the point of this is that you know, we wanna make sure that we address acute pain the right way. Um, sometimes opioids are indicated, but we can use a lot of other modalities to try to minimize how much uh, opioids really contribute to, pain to our pain management plan. 
The problem with not treating pain well is that it can become chronic pain. And I think we know from the other work of Professor Kalit and colleagues that the incidence of chronic pain does vary by surgery, um, but I think that it, uh, because its significance um, can actually um, be much greater than just chronic pain um, in the sense that it can actually cause disability and have much more widespread societal impact, we all have to care about chronic pain because chronic pain is truly a public health problem. In the United States, we've estimated that chronic pain actually costs the healthcare system over $600 billion, um, which I think um, is in incredibly impactful. I mean, not to, not to mention the fact that it's such a large number, it's hard to fathom, um, but the idea that chronic pain in so many different ways, whether it's an unplanned emergency department visits or excess clinic visits, or operations in particular that uh, have pain as the primary indication. Um, all of these can be directly or indirectly attributed to pain. And I think when we look very carefully at pain, we know that it is highly individual. We know that certain surgeries have different pain trajectories or the resolution of pain is different for certain surgeries versus others. So knee arthroplasty yeah, has, has been shown in this and other studies to have a longer pain resolution trajectory than other operations, even similar operations like hip arthroplasty. We also know from data from the University of Florida that even within the same types of surgeries, that pain trajectories can vary by the individual. And this is this graph, this with five lines, actually shows five naturally occurring trajectories of pain. And this is no matter what type of operation you're having, yeah, there are people who will have 10 out of 10 pain at the very beginning after surgery is over, and they'll still have 10 out of 10 pain in a week. And I think we've all seen those patients. There are also patients on the opposite end, when you look at the bottom line, who have essentially no pain after surgery, which is somewhat unexpected, and then they may, and they continue to have no pain. And then there's the downward sloping dashed line that actually shows that some patients will have higher pain immediately after surgery, and then that pain gets better over the first few days. And this is typically what we expect all patients to do, but as you can tell, yeah, that's only one of five natural trajectories. Um, why certain people have one trajectory versus another um, is actually still a subject of active research, and we can't even and we can't even account for a half of the variance you know, between individuals currently. So yeah, stay tuned for more research on this. So what do we do about it? I think that one of the issues that is, um, I think, very important in our current healthcare climate is that we cannot predict which patients are going to have more pain, and we can't predict which patients are going to have longer opioid use. So it's very important that we have good surveillance. And one model of surveillance is the transitional pain service. Um, the model that we have tried to emulate is the Toronto General Hospital model, which was started by Hans Clark from the University of Toronto. And it's this concept that there should be a pain service that fits neatly in between the acute pain phase and the chronic pain phase, um, because chronic pain is still defined as pain lasting more than three months. And I think we know that you know, for patients who are going beyond the hospital and continuing to have a longer pain trajectory, you know, the opportunity for us, I think, is to be able to offer additional interventions that help patients um, who are still having pain or even greater than expected pain um, to continue to have recovery from surgery and continue to have physical therapy and other rehabilitative exercises you know, that can make their recovery uh, from, uh, from surgery much better. And so, so even some of the chronic pain interventions that we uh, traditionally have ascribed to the elective pain clinic world may be very useful in the subacute period or transitional phase. And some of these we've already started to employ, things like cryoneurolysis and neuromodulation are newer techniques you know, that may be applicable to some of our patients um, who have greater or longer duration of pain. One of the tough things I think in starting any new practice or service is coming up with a business model. And so you know, this project that we worked on with an economist and anesthesiologist, Dr. Eric Sun, you know, really focused on looking at what would, what would it look like to hypothetically come up with a, a business plan. Um, and so if you read the graph on the right, 
uh, the y-axis shows the ratio of savings to cost. So the key number there is one. So when you cross one, now your savings are greater than your costs. So now you become cost saving. Um, and in order to, to cross that line, you can see that the first line to cross is the blue line. The blue line has high benefit. So whatever you employ, in this case, it could be a transitional pain service. It has to achieve 50% reduction of whatever it is. And we've been able to show within our institution that a transitional pain service can reduce prescribed opioids by two thirds. So it exceeds the 50% mark and is considered a high benefit. The intensity or the low intensity versus high intensity has to do with how many resources you put towards a program. So the more staff, the higher intensity. So if you have a lower intensity program where you say, for example, are utilizing existing staff or perhaps sharing resources. So certain positions not only do transitional pain, but they also do acute pain, which is how our system is set up, then you're more likely to cost less. And that allows you to exceed that, that ratio of greater savings to cost. Stay tuned, there's a lot more to, to come, I think, in terms of transitional pain services. Um, but I'll leave you with this graph. You know, this is basically the way that we've tried to formulate our care of the patient. And it doesn't just start when we see the patient on the day of surgery, and it doesn't stop when patients leave the hospital. You know, the concept with transitional pain is that we're really trying to manage the continuum of care from the time that patients decide to have surgery until the time they've fully recovered. Um, it is much more in line with the periodic Operative surgical home model of care, and that's the way that we've created our type of system. You know, patients who have chronic opioid use, substance use disorder, chronic pain, and they need much more preparation before surgery and much more collaboration with other disciplines. And then they have to have uh, established evidence-based protocols in place when they come to the hospital. And then they need that, that critical surveillance the availability of a transitional pain service when they leave the hospital. After assuming that you had a successful acute pain management plan, we still have to watch them for greater than expected subacute pain, as well as longer term opioid use. And only by doing this, I think, is how we're going to make a difference for patients in the long term. Thank you very much for your attention.